If you bought a new Intel CPU for your PC, there's a good chance that you got one of these with it. This is the Intel Laminar RM1 CPU cooler. And in fact, if you buy any one of these CPUs, there's a lot in there. And since those CPUs come with this in the box, Intel must think that this is capable of cooling it, right? According to Intel's site, the RM1 is capable of cooling CPUs with a TDP up to 65 watts. That's all well and good, but some of these CPUs can draw a lot more power than 65 watts. For instance, the Intel i7-14700 with a TDP of 65 watts is capable of a max boost of up to 219 watts. Even the Core i3-14100 can draw up to 100 watts during boost. So today we're going to answer a question that's been on my mind for quite a while. Just how bad is the Intel stock CPU cooler? And what better way to test it out than with our handy dandy test bench? While technically my Intel i7-12700KF has a TDP of 125 watts, its max power usage when not overclocked is only 190 watts, which you'll notice is less than the 14700. So we're gonna use it as the basis to see just how bad this CPU cooler is, despite being included in the box with a lot of these CPUs. So I have this new inbox RM1 cooler. We're gonna take it out, we're gonna install it on our test bench, and we're gonna see just how bad it is. All right, so all we gotta do here is install it now. So we're just gonna lay it down, make sure we line up all of these little guys onto the holes. Supposedly, all we gotta do is push down. You should hear a click. Fully seated, so let's get the opposite corner now. Okay, that seems to be uh, pretty well seated on there. Everything's nice and tight. We can plug our fan in to our CPU fan port. Okay, and then I'm gonna put my RAM back in now that I'm not worried about breaking it. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we are going to test a single core benchmark in Cinebench and see how well this little cooler can do. So we're gonna run a 10 minute test. The system is bone stock. I just reset the BIOS. There's absolutely nothing special about it. All we did was enable XMP on our RAM and restart the computer. So we're gonna do a 10 minute test of the single core performance and we'll have hardware info up so we can see just how well or badly this cooler does. All right, let's start it up. Right away, you can hear that fan spooling up, which means it's probably getting kind of warm. Seems like it's coping pretty well with a single core benchmark. So we're gonna let it run till the end, and then we'll start with a multi-core. All right, so we're coming up to the end of our run here. This is a single core, single run of Cinebench 23. And here's the result. We had an absolute max power usage of 72 watts. And towards the end, the average power was around 43 watts. And our absolute maximum temperature we saw on a core was 84 degrees. And that's with just a single core performance. Let's see how it does with the multi-core. And I have a feeling that it might not even make it through the 10 minute test. Instantly, we got several P cores hitting their thermal throttling. That fan's working as hard as it can, but it just cannot keep up. At this point in the test, we would like to see somewhere around 150 to 180 watts being drawn. We're only drawing 111 watts. It's pretty poor. And we're only a couple minutes in. You can also see here as we scroll up, we're only hitting about 3.6 gigahertz on our performance cores and even lower on the E cores. So this thing is really, really throttling back to make sure that it, uh, doesn't blow up. Okay, we're coming to the end of the multi-core test and let's take a look at the results because they're they're pretty bad. In brighter news, a couple of the cores haven't hit 100 degrees C yet, so that's nice. In other news, most of them did. Also, we are pulling now 105 watts, pretty low, um, and the average temperature is, it's off the charts. It's 92 degrees overall, so it's bad. Maybe, uh, maybe we can play a game instead of a benchmark because clearly this is not up to the task of any sort of CPU load. And at a final score of just over 16,000 points, that might be the worst Intel 12th gen i7 score ever. All right, so we preset our graphics on the Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 Benchmark 2 Ultra. It's at 1920 by 1080 because that's what my capture card is limited to. So let's find out what kind of FPS we're able to get out of our CPU. All right, out of the gate, we're looking pretty good. 180, 190 FPS. It's not too shabby. Coming in around 200. Keep in mind, this is at 1080p, so, you know, keep those numbers with a grain of salt here. 
can see here we averaged 211 FPS and we were actually still bottlenecked by our GPU. Incredible considering that's a tiny CPU cooler. So realistically, if you have an open air case or a case with really good airflow, you can probably play games with this at least for a short period of time now, the benchmark is pretty short. So your mileage may vary if you're doing like a longer gaming session or maybe it's the summer and your room gets really hot, but you can play a game on this. So now that we've established what the free RM1 Intel stock cooler can do, let's compare it to another air cooler that costs just $18. This is the Thermalrite Assassin X 120R SE. And it can be bought for just $17.90 on Amazon before tax. And one thing you're gonna notice that for $18, instead of just getting a block of aluminum with maybe like a thin slice of copper, you actually get a bunch of heat pipes and fins, a pretty decent size fan, and a bunch of accessories. So you don't necessarily have to use it on Intel CPU, but the difference between the heat pipe technology and just an aluminum heat sink is gonna be huge. So let's install this on our test bench and show you just how much better of cooling you get for just $18. First things first, we gotta get the old cooler off. Start by unplugging it. Again, we're gonna take our RAM out just to be safe. And all we gotta do is kind of pull up on these four tabs, pull it right out. You can see we actually got pretty even uh, distribution there of the included thermal paste. So yeah, I'd say that was a pretty accurate test. It is very quick and easy to install this cooler. And for that nice low bar of just $18, I think you're really gonna like the performance difference of this cooler versus the stock cooler. Let's start off just like we did last time with a single core, single run of Cinebench and see how it compares. All right, single core run. The first thing that you'll notice is the computer is super quiet, even while running this benchmark. You almost can't even hear the fan. If for nothing else, that's worth the $18. An interesting thing to note, and I didn't think to write down the amount of time that it took last time to do this, but even though it's only drawing around 40 to 42 watts as it goes around, it does appear to be doing this single core run faster than the last one. The last one felt like it was just barely chugging along and it took a really long time. This one does seem to be moving a lot faster. All right, we're at the end of the run here. Looks like it did pretty well. The max temperature was only 57 degrees and we were pulling between 37 and 39 watts for the remainder of that run. Now, the real test, let's see how it does in a 10 minute multi-core run. You'll notice that it didn't immediately jump up to 100 degrees either. It's gonna get pretty hot and likely will still thermal throttle, but you'll already notice how much better this cooler works versus the Intel stock cooler. Okay, we're coming into the end of this run, so I just wanted to show you guys the difference $17, $18 can make. First, we're still pulling nearly 200 watts of power out of this CPU. Our max temperature is only 89 degrees, and while that is pretty hot, that means we're not thermal throttling. We're still hitting our full boost numbers, which means the P cores are at 4.7 gigahertz, and the E cores are at 3.6 gigahertz. So $18, and we're not thermal throttling, we're pulling a ton of power, and it's quiet. If you really still needed a reason to not use this CPU cooler, hopefully this is enough to tell you. Spend just a little bit of money and get something way, way better. And look at that score by comparison. 22,000, that's a 30% increase on the score versus the last one. What can I say? The RM1 is terrible. Finally, let's switch over to the game and see if the benchmark looks any different. Based on the fact that our GPU was our bottleneck last time, it's unlikely that we'll see any actual FPS difference, but we'll still get to see what the CPU is capable of versus what it was capable of with the RM1. All right, we've got the exact same graphic settings on here. Nothing's different except for that CPU cooler. Let's see how the benchmark does. Okay, like we expected here, we're seeing very similar FPS numbers. We are bottlenecked by the GPU, not the CPU. So we'll just have to wait till the end to find out exactly how much of a difference the CPU cooler is making. All right, and there we have it. We've got an average of 302 FPS from our CPU versus the 282 there was before. Not a whole lot difference, but it is something. Our average F FPS was about the same, so no real issues there. So realistically, if you're doing anything other than just playing a game for five or 10 minutes, you should really consider throwing the stock cooler away or maybe selling it on eBay and using that money towards a nice little CPU cooler like this one from Thermalrite because the results really speak for themselves. Quieter, it cools way better, and it really doesn't cost a lot. There you have it. 
don't use your Intel stock cooler. You know, speaking of Intel CPUs, maybe you should go check out the budget CPU video I put out recently. It's a really good video checking out the differences between Ryzen and Intel if you're on a tight budget for your new PC build. Check it out.